Okay, we are going to do some more stuff with the fundamental theorem of calculus. That's how we can do definite integrals. Uh, we're going to do some more stuff with it today. Uh, the next page is going to be a little bit weird. This one hopefully is okay. Um, but again, this is this is fairly important stuff, right? That's why it's called the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, so, so if you're having trouble with any of this, make sure you ask questions. Make sure you come address those, um, because if you're struggling with this, it's it's going to continue to be a problem. Because this is a fairly large concept on your AP exam, right? Uh, let's do this first example, and then we'll do kind of the two after it uh, as a little offshoot. It says, given this derivative, dy dx, that's your derivative. So, given your derivative is 3x squared plus 4x minus 5, and it tells me my initial condition, y of 2 equals negative 1. Again, that could be written like this, uh, the coordinate point to negative 1. So, so I've given the derivative, I have a point on the function, I have that piece of information, it says find y of 3. Find that second y coordinate, right, if the x value is 3, what's the y value going to be? I know one coordinate, I know one x and the corresponding y, and then we're trying to figure out a second point, that second y value when x is 3. Okay, so we can do this two different ways. The method one way, we're going to do an indefinite integral. I'm going to integrate, I'm going to get up to that original function, I'm going to have to use that condition to solve for c, and once I have that particular solution, then I can just plug in 3. And once I have that completed particular solution, plugging in 3 is going to be easy. Okay, so the method one way is probably conceptually easier, uh, it's more straightforward. Uh, but it requires you to do the calculus. You have to go through and do this indefinite integral, then you have to solve for the C, right? It's a lot of you work. Uh, but let's, let's go through and do it. I'm going to integrate. Remember, here's y prime. Uh, to get that original function, you would need to integrate. The integration of x, uh, 3x squared uh, would be x cubed. The integration or the antiderivative of 4x would be plus 2x squared. And then you're going to have a minus 5x plus c. Okay, so we could do the indefinite integral. That's nice. And now let's use the condition, right? I'm going to plug in 2 for x, set it equal to negative 1. So negative 1 is going to equal uh, 2 cubed is 8. 2 squared is 4 times 2. That's another 8. 2 times 5 would be 10. Right, so I'm using my condition to solve for the c value. Uh, let's see, here we've got 16 minus 10, so that's 6 plus c. So I know my c value is negative 7, right? So I could actually get this particular solution x cubed plus 2x squared minus 5x minus 7. And once I have used my first piece of information, once I use that first coordinate point that I know, uh, once I've used it to get the completed particular solution, now now that second point is easy, right? If you wanted to know y of 3, you just plug in 3, get out your y put, uh, get out your y value, your output. Uh, or if you wanted to know y of 10, you easily just plug in 10. Uh, if you know one point, use it to solve for the c, and once you have this completed function, you could then plug in any second, or any third, or any fourth, or how, whatever other many points you want to know. Once you have the function, plug in the x to solve for the y. Uh, so once you have this, then evaluating it, in getting the second coordinate point is easy. 3 cubed plus 2 times 3 squared minus 5 times 3 minus 7. So that would be 27 plus, that's 18, or sorry, that's 9 times 2, so that's 18, minus 15, minus 7. Look, all that's 3, right? 18 minus 15, that's 3. 27 and 3 is 30. 30 minus 7 is going to end up being 23. So I know that second coordinate point is 3 23, right? That's what your y of 3 value is. So if you know the derivative, and if you know one point on the original function, you can use this method 1. I could integrate, use my first point to solve for the c value, and then once you have the completed function, finding any second point is easier. If you had to find a third point, it would be easy, right? Uh, but I could use my derivative and the first piece of information that I know to then find any second or any third or any other uh, pieces of information in the other points. But you got to know the derivative and you got to know one point, right? So without that piece of information, without that first point, the best you could do is the general solution. But if I know that one point, I can solve it for c. And once I have that function completed, the particular solution, then plugging it in with any other second value is easy. Okay, now what if we, what if we didn't want to do it this way? What if instead of an indefinite integral, what if I wanted to use a definite integral? What if I wanted to use this fundamental theorem of calculus? Well, 
you can. Uh, let's check it out. Remember, here is your fundamental theorem of calculus. If I integrate the derivative from a to b, uh, you're going to integrate. So you undo the derivative. So instead of f prime, you're going to integrate. You'd be plugging into f. And then you would evaluate by plugging in b and then plugging in a and then subtracting. Right. So there's my fundamental theorem of calculus. That's important. If you don't know it, you really should. Uh, let's try to set up an equation that mirrors it. Remember, the two things that I know, I know this point. Uh, at x equals 2, the y value is negative 1. And then the other point that I want to know, right, assuming we haven't done this, right, going back to the question and kind of just answering it a different way, I know something about x equals 2, and then I want to know something about x equals 3. I have the derivative, so now I'm going to set up, I'm going to integrate uh, the derivative. So I'd integrate 3x squared plus 4x minus 5. I'm going to integrate that derivative, and that would be f of something minus f of something else. But I would have to figure out what are the a and the b values. And one of them has to be the x value that you know, that piece of information that you have. Uh, and then the second one has to be the piece of information that you want to have, right? One of them is what you know. The other one is what you want to know. So for this particular question, I know stuff about uh, x equals 2. And then I want to know stuff about 3. So I'm going to set up this integral from 2 to 3. Right, that's the one that I, I knew about. That was the point that I was given. And then 3 is the x value I want to know about. So I'm setting up this equation with the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, now, this is going to be a definite integral on the left. Now, you'd have to plug in the 3. So whichever one you have on the top gets plugged in first. Whichever one you have on the bottom gets plugged in second. If you wanted to flip the order, that's OK. Just make sure the, the order on the other side is reversed. The two negatives would cancel. Uh, but I'm going to set up my fundamental theorem of calculus. Integrate, uh, integrate the derivative. And then you have to pick which two x values. One of them you know about. The other one you want to know about. And then make sure you have the other side of the equation. Whichever one's on top gets plugged in first. Whichever one's on bottom. It's plugged in second. And now this is the thing that we're looking for, right? That's what the question is trying to get us to solve and spit back as the answer. So I'm quickly just going to do a little bit of algebra. I'm going to take this. I'm going to add it over, right? So I'm going to get an equation that's got f of 3 by itself, right? So take this, add it over. I'd have f of 2 plus the integration from 2 to 3. And the thing that you're integrating is that derivative function. So I set up my equation based on the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to isolate it for the piece that I'm trying to solve for. And then we can go ahead and proceed to, to do this. And, and we're, we're going to be able to do it, I think, pretty OK. Now, could you do this definite integral by hand? Yes, right? It's not too bad. Uh, could I also use the calculator to do this? Yes, the calculator couldn't help me on the method one, because the calculator can't do an indefinite integral. You would have to be able to do that by hand, and then you would have to solve for the c value and plug it in by hand. The only thing the calculator could have done is once you have the particular solution, you could have just plugged it in with the calculator and looked at your y uh, vars, y vars, y1, or looked at your table, right? or you could have just plugged it in manually on the home screen. But the, you would have to do the calculus, and the calculator would only help you with the computations at the end. Uh, but here, for a definite integral, the calculator could do this. Uh, now, we could do it by hand, uh, but, but I'm going to skip that for now, just for the sake of making this uh, video a little bit shorter. Could I do this definite integral by hand? Yes. I'm not going to, because uh, that, that would just take a little bit of extra time. Uh, but I could do this by hand. Instead, I'm going to use my graphing data calculator, my GDC. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to math nine that sucker with my calculator. OK, so let's get it out. Uh, let's plug in all the stuff that we know, right? f of 3, that's what we're trying to solve for. f of 2, I was given. Remember, f of 2, it told me, instead of f, I have it as y. It doesn't matter. f of 2 is negative 1. And then I'm going to math 9 this to figure out what the value for that integration is. Get out of there, math 9. So we got 2 to 3. And then type it in. And you're typing in the derivative function. 3x squared plus 4x minus 5. Oh my gosh, I totally didn't even do that right. So let's try that again. Math 9 from 2 to 3. Uh, 3x squared plus 4x minus 5. That looks a little bit better. Uh, and then the calculator can speed up that process, and it can do it for me. And then it's going to tell me, hey, 
Mr. Bell, this, this integration, if you were to do it, would end up being 24. You're like, oh, that's, thanks, thanks, calculator. That's, that's so nice of you, right? You can math nine this, and then look at the answer. Negative one plus 24, I could end up finding that second y value, right? If x is three, I could end up finding that that second y value is 23. So that would give me the point 323. Is that the same as what I got before when I did the method one way? Yes, of course it should be the same. It's, it's literally the exact same question. You're just doing it in a different way, right? And so conceptually, what you need to understand is this method one way, while it's, well, it's probably easier and it's more straightforward, it requires you to do basically all the calculus. You have to do the indefinite integral, then you have to solve for C. Once you have that completed function, then plugging it in and computing whatever that second x value is or whatever uh, it wants you to get as a result, that would be easy, right? Just plugging and chugging, and the calculator could help you from that point forward. But what's nice about this method too, when you're using the fundamental theorem of calculus, the calculator can do the calculus for you, right? It can do the definite integral, and then I'm just gonna take that point that I initially knew, I'm gonna add in that value from the integration, and then that's gonna tell me my, my final value. Okay, so let's, let's kinda conceptually think about something for a minute. Actually, no, we'll, we'll just go to the next example. Alrighty, uh, so let's, let's move it on. So, so sometimes this method two way is, is the only way it'll work, right? Remember the method one, you have to integrate. On method two, the calculator does the integration for you. Well, sometimes you're gonna see functions that are not possible for you to integrate, like this one, sine of x squared. That's not something that we could integrate. It's not even something you could do u substitution with. If you had an extra x out in the front, u sub would work. But since the variable is supposed to be there and it's not, uh, it just isn't going to work for you to try to u sub. So if I tried to do this via a method one way, if I tried to do an indefinite integral and then tried to use this condition to solve for c, you would get stuck because this is not something that you can integrate. It's a non-integrable function. Okay, so the method one way, out the door. Let's try to do it the method two way. Let's try to set up an equation using the fundamental theorem, and then let's try to solve it uh, by using the calculator. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna integrate this derivative. So sine of x squared, and then that's gonna be equal f of something minus f of something else, and I have to decide which two x values do I use uh, and which two x values do I use. And whatever one's on top gets plugged in first, whichever one's on the bottom gets, gets plugged in second. Uh, now let's look at what it gives us. It says f of one is negative five, so I know something about x equals one, and then I want to know something about x equals two. So I'm gonna use one to two. And then you, if you wanted to flip the order, that's fine, but whatever one's on top gets plugged in first, whichever one's on bottom gets plugged in second and subtracted from it. So I'm gonna set up this equation from the fundamental theorem. Remember, this is the thing that we're trying to solve for, so I'm gonna isolate it. I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna add it over, and I know f of two would be equal to, add that chunk over, f of one plus the integration from one to two, and the thing that you're integrating was that derivative right, the f prime. And then f of one, the question told us, right, f of one is negative five. And then this value, right, if I tried to do it a method one way, I wouldn't be able to do the integration. But what's nice is that this method two way, you can do the, the integration with the calculator. Make sure your, your calculator's in radian mode. Since you have trig, if you're in degree mode, you're gonna be in trouble. Here, yep, mine's in, mine's in radian. So let's go through and do this integration. Let's math nine it in my calculator. Math nine, and then it's from one to two. I've got sine of x squared. Close the parentheses, uh, and then there we go. And then of course, define your variable x. So that ends up being a pretty ugly number, 0.49 uh, four, five, zero, eight, whatever, 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 it keeps going. And then I would take negative five plus that answer. And then there we go, I could get my expression or I could get my answer, f of two is going to be negative 4.505. So if you're given one point on the function, 
right? If I know one point, now here is written f of 1 equals negative 5. Later, you may see it written just as a coordinate point. That's okay. But if you have one piece of information and the derivative, you can actually use that to figure out a second point, or you could get a third point, or you could get however many, many, how many other points you want. As long as you have one and the derivative, you're always going to be able to get another. Right, and that process using the fundamental theorem of calculus is rather nice because it, 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 it involves the, that definite integral which the calculator can do for you. So sometimes a method one way won't work because sometimes you're not able to do the integration. And if you can't do the integration, you can't solve for c. If you don't have the c value, you cannot get the particular solution. And if you don't have this completed particular solution, you can't just plug in and find that second y value. Right? But the calculator can always, always, always do the integration for us. So that method two way, utilizing that fundamental theorem of calculus, is really pretty nice. All right, quick conceptual thing uh, as a follow up. It says, what if we had been given f of 2 and then asked to find f of 1? Let's, let's see, right? f, uh, the integration, you, you would still be using 1 and 2, right? So the left side of this equation really wouldn't change at all. Uh, the only difference is, hey, like previously, it gave me f of 1. And then f of 2 was what I was missing. So, so I just took this chunk that I knew and I added it over and I just isolated the piece that I was missing, right? The piece that I was looking for. Uh, what if it was reversed? What if this was the piece that I knew and what if f of 1 uh, was the piece I was, I, was, I was trying to solve for? Well, you would just change the algebra a little bit, right? If I wanted to do algebra and I wanted to get f of 1 by itself, there's really two ways you could do it. I could take this right, this f of 2, and I, I could subtract it over. If I took that and I subtract it over, I would have to either multiply or divide by a negative to get the f of 1 by itself. Right? That's one way to do it, though. Uh, another way is to think, hey, if I take this f of 1, if I add this over to the left, you'd have something that looks like this. Uh, and then you could take the integral and you could subtract it right? Because you wouldn't want f of 1 plus all this stuff. You'd want the f of 1 by itself. So then you could take the integral and subtract it. Basically, these two switch sides. The f of 1, add it over. The integral, subtract it over. And you could get this expression that f of 1 is equal to f of 2 minus the integration from 1 to 2. And remember, the thing that you're integrating is the derivative. It's your f prime. So, so conceptually, what would be different? Well, not a whole lot. It would just change the order in which you, you isolate, right? It, it changes the algebra. Uh, but you would still be able to use the calculator to do this. And if you were given this piece of information, you could just subtract that math 9 value. And then you'd be good to go. OK, follow up little twist. Would this be the same if I had f of 2 plus the integration from 2 to 1? So if I had taken this integration, which uh, had 1 and 2, uh, if I flipped it, and if I put 2 on the bottom and 1 on the top, if I flip the order for the integration, but I also change it from a negative to a positive, are these two the same? Yes, they, they are the same because we have that property. Remember, a to b equals negative b to a. If I flip the order for the integration, all you'd have to do is flip the sign. Uh, so, so yes, both of those would work. Both of them would get you the right answer. Generally, what I try to get my students to remember is that whenever you're looking for a second y value, Right? Whenever you have some first one and you're looking for a second one, whether it's ones and twos or whether it's uh, threes and fives or, or twos and threes, whatever, it doesn't matter. If I have one point and I'm trying to find a second point, if you take the one that you know and then add in the amount of change, remember your derivative is your rate of change, it's the slope. And if you integrate your rate of change, you get your amount of change. And if you take your initial value, and if you add in the amount of change, conceptually, doesn't that make sense? Initial plus the amount of change should give you the final value. And then even if you have to integrate backwards from the right to the left, the negatives will take care of themselves. So generally what you need to think is, hey, if I take my initial value, the one that I know about, and if I'm going to add the accumulation of change, uh, then this value and this value, those two numbers should match. If this is a plus, those two numbers should match. And then the final value, what you want to know, should be the upper limit. If 
I take my initial, the thing that I know about to begin with, then I add in all of the change from what I know to what I want to know, then, then that equation's always going to work. Even if you end up working from the right to the left, it's okay, right? And if I take my initial and I add in the change from to, right, those should always match, from to to what you want to know, one, uh, the negatives will take care of themselves, and this will work. Right, so conceptually, let's uh, let's kind of think about this. You have your your fundamental theorem of calculus. If I integrate the derivative from a to b, remember that's going to end up being f of b minus f of a. Let's say I know uh, this one, and then I want to know the second one. Right, so if I'm given one point and then you're asked for a second point, you could just do algebra to rearrange it. Take this piece and add it over. f of b would be equal to f of a plus the integration from a to b. And the thing that you're integrating is the derivative. Right, so you would take your initial y value and then you add in your amount of change and if you take your initial, you add in the amount to change. Remember, to get the amount to change, you integrate the rate of change, and then that would give you your final y value. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, if you take your initial, add in the change, that's going to give you your final. Uh, and, if, and if this is a plus, then those two numbers should always match, and then those two numbers should always match. If for some reason, right, that's typically when we're working from the left to the right, if for some reason you're ever working backwards, then there's really two things you could do. If I wanted to know f of a, well, I could take f of b, and then I could work my way backwards, right? If I wanted to know this first value, Right? I could take my final value and I could subtract the change. Right, Final minus the change equals initial. That should make sense. Or you could think about it like this, right? a little bit simpler. That one's, that one's okay, but I, I, would, I would maybe even do it a little bit simpler. I would take the one that you know, and then I would add in the amount of change. And if those two match, you know this formula is always, always, always going to work. The big difference is that now when you do this integration, when you do this math 9, that integration will give you a negative number, right? So instead of taking your final and then subtracting the positive change, here you're going to take that, that final, I'm going to add in the amount to change, but when I integrate backwards, this number will now be negative. So the negatives are going to work. But in general, what I always like to think is uh, whenever you know some number, just start with the, the y value of that number, then you add the integration from that number, and if those two match, then it should always, always, always be a plus, and then those two should match, right? Take the value that you know, and then add the amount of change from what you know to what you want to know, and then that is conceptually always going to work, even if you're working from right to left. The negatives will work, out, uh, will work themselves out. But that fundamental theorem of calculus, if you know one point on the function and you know the derivative, it's going to end up working. Now, conceptually, let's talk a little bit more about it, right? This is some weird stuff, but hopefully it makes sense. Here's your fundamental theorem of calculus. Another way that you could think about it, that's kind of what we just did. Remember, the integral of your rate with respect to time is your amount of change. Sometimes it'll be x, sometimes it'll be t. You really don't see anything else. But the integral of your rate is your amount of change. So that's kind of nice. But let's look at this, which is what we're going to be focused on uh, for the next two examples. If I integrate f prime, remember that just means it's the area bounded by f prime and the x-axis. If I find the area bounded by f prime between a and b, that's going to end up giving me the change, right? If I think about slope, it's the rise over the run, it's y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? Something like this, f of b, y2 minus f of a, that's your rise, that's the change in your y values, right? So if I get the area bounded by the derivative, it's going to end up telling me f of b minus f of a, it's going to end up telling you the change in the y value for your original function. Of course, it's only between those two uh, values also. 
right? So it's weird. This this fundamental theorem of calculus, it's got some weird little applications. The area bounded by the derivative is how much change your y values are going to go through. Let's take that and let's apply it. Let's look at this, this next example. I try to keep it on the screen. I'm doing a bad job at it. That's okay. Okay, the graph of f prime consists of two line segments and a semicircle as shown on the right. It gives me this fact that f of negative 2 equals 5, and it says find some other points. Find f of 0, find f of 2, find f of 6. Okay, now if you need to, right, especially when you're just starting, uh, just, just kind of begin with the, with the, uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus. Let's set it up. I'm going to integrate the derivative, and that would be f of something minus f of something else, then you'd have to figure out which two x values do you want to use. Well, for part a, I know something about negative 2, and then I want to know something about 0, so I'm going to use negative 2 and 0. The order, if you flip it, that's okay. Just make sure whichever one you have on top gets plugged in first, whichever one you have on the bottom gets plugged in second. So you can set up your equation from your fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, this is pretty easy, right? It's the area bounded by f prime between these two points. Looks like that area is a triangle. I can find the area of that triangle pretty easily. Uh, and then it tells me what this is, and then this is the piece I want to know, right? So I can get that by just computing the area. And then uh, that's the piece that I'm looking for. That's the piece I was given. Let's rearrange it. Let's just solve it for the piece that we're looking for, f of 0. If you take this piece and add it over, you would have f of negative 2 plus the integration. And what you're integrating is f prime. It's the derivative. Uh, but what you're integrating it through would be from negative 2, from the value you know, to 0, uh, the value you want to know. So if I take my initial value and I add in the accumulation of change, that's going to end up giving you that final value. Let's plug it in. f of negative 2 was 5. And then I can compute this, right? It's the area bounded by f prime. It's the area of this triangle. Let's see the area. 1 half base times height. The base is 2. The height looks like 4. So it looks like the area of this region uh, is going to be 4. So if I were to take my initial value, 4, and then add in this area, which was, or sorry, the initial value was 5, then add in the, the value, which was 4 for the area, it looks like that second y value on my function, it looks like it is going to be 9. Now let's think about graphing this, right? Here's the graph of the derivative, but if I wanted the graph of f prime, let's just plot the points that we already knew. All right, it says 1, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So there we go, there's 10, 5. Uh, and then let's see, we're going to have to go over to 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So if you wanted to plot this stuff, the, the initial point that we were given was negative 2, 5. And then it was asking me, hey, where's this y-intercept going to be? Where's the y-value when x is 0? Where is this point going to be? Well, what the fundamental theorem of calculus tells me is that, hey, between negative 2 and 0, however much area you encapsulate, right, flip it back over, where am I looking for? Uh, however much area you encapsulate with your derivative, that's going to end up being your change in your y values for your original function. So if between negative 2 and 0, if your derivative has 4 units worth of area, well then that means this y value is going to go up 4 units, right? And let's think about it. If I took 5 and if I add 4, that would end up giving you that second point. The change in the y values, how far it went up. Remember, you went from negative 2 to 0, right, over that same interval. How far you go up, or potentially how far you go down, that's based on the area that you incorporate from the derivative. A okay, little bit weird. Let's keep going. Okay, f of 2. Again, we could set it up. I'm going to integrate the derivative which would be f of something minus f of something else. Now, you could go back and you could use negative 2 and 2, uh, but you don't have to do that. You don't have to do negative 2 to 2. Now that I know f of 0, right, I know f of 0 is 9, so I've got this other coordinate point. Uh, here, that one was negative 2, 5. 
Uh, once you now know this kind of more updated point, uh, you're welcome to use it. So instead of doing negative 2 to 2, I'm going to use the closer point 0 to 2. So I'm going to integrate the derivative from 0 to 2, and then that means I would have f of 2 minus f of 0. This is the piece that we're trying to solve for, so let's rearrange it. f of 2 would be equal to f of 0 plus the integration from 0 to 2. So if I take f of 0, which we knew from previous question was 9, and then plus, I need to get the area bounded by f prime. So now I'm looking at this region, which also I think that area is going to be 4. Uh, I can end up finding what that next y value is going to be. And it'll be 13. You take your previous y value and you add in the change. How do you get the change? Well, however much area is bounded by your derivative, that tells you the change in the y values for your original function. So now I know this point is 2, comma 13. I know f of 2 is 13. So if I were to go back and actually plot that point, right, if I want to know, hey, when x equals 2, how high or how low is it going to be? I would take my most recent point and now just incorporate in the change. Since my derivative built in another four units worth of area, this y value is going to have to go up four. Right, so one, two, three, and it's going to be up here at, at 13. So again, over that interval between the 0 and the 2, if you wanted to know, hey, how, how much is this y value going to go up, the amount that it goes up is the same as the area bounded by the derivative in that little interval. Now, if you didn't want to do 0 to 2, could I have gone back and could I have done uh, negative 2 to 2? Yes, let's, let's do it quickly. If you wanted to do negative 2 to 2, right, negative 2 was where I started, it would work. Right, so you'd set it up. Remember, this is the thing we were trying to solve for. So you would take this and add it over. So I know f of 2, it would be equal. Take this chunk and add it over. You'd have f of negative 2 plus the integration uh, from negative 2 to 2. And the thing that you're integrating is f prime. You could take that initial value, which for us was 5, and then I could add in all of the area between negative 2 and 2. Let's look. If I got all of the area, uh, that means both of these triangles, right? Or you need the one big triangle. That was 4 and that was 4. So this total area is 8. If I took my initial y value and I added an 8, it would get you the 13 the same as it was previously. Right? So think about it like this. If I know the middle step is 10, 10 plus that next change will get you up to 13. That's the same thing as taking your original value and then doing, hey, this total change, which is 8, 5 plus the 8 will get you up to the 13. But w what I think is easier, once, once you know this middle point, instead of going back and redoing everything in reference to your initial point, just, just look at the change between those, those closest two points, right? Uh, but the area bounded by your derivative, it tells me how much change your y values are going to go through. Okay, last part for this first example. Okay, it says find f of 6. Remember, I now know three points. I know f of negative 2, I know f of 0, and I know f of 2. It doesn't matter which one you use. I would advise you use the closest one to it. So we're going to set up this formula. We're going to say the integration of the derivative. I'm going to use 2 and 6. That means I'd have f of 6 minus f of 2. This is the piece I'm trying to solve for, so I'm just going to take this piece and, and add it over. That means f of 6 will be f of 2, the most recent point that you know about. Then I would add in the change from 2 to 6, and the thing that you're integrating is the derivative. Okay, f of 2, that value we just did was 13, and then I'd have to go get the area bounded by f prime between 2 and 6. Right, the area bounded by the derivative is going to tell me how much change the y values for your original functions go through. That looks like a semicircle, so it's going to be 1 half pi r squared. Uh, the radius, be careful, the radius isn't 4, the radius is only halfway, so your radius here is 2. Uh, so it looks like that's 1 half of 4 pi. 
So it looks like this area is 2 pi, but since that area is beneath the x-axis, we know that would actually end up counting as negative, right? So be careful. Area is 2 pi, but since it's beneath the x-axis, it would accumulate as negative. So then that second y value, you could write it, or I guess it's the third y value, 13 minus 2 pi. That's an ugly coordinate, that's okay. Two pi is gonna be about six, so, so that coordinate would be somewhere about seven-ish. But if we're thinking about, okay, over here at six, where is this y value gonna be? Since my derivative incorporated in this region, and since that region had a negative area because it was below the x-axis, I know from this point it's gonna go down. And how far down it goes is based on how much area is in the derivative. Uh, since this had about 2 pi units worth of area, that means this drop in the y values, right, that change in y, is going to be negative 2 pi. So it's going to go down about 6, and then it would land somewhere around 7-ish. Right, so figuring out, once I know one point of my function, figuring out where those other ensuing points are going to be, you can use your fundamental theorem of calculus and it tells you the change, right, the gap between your y values, whether your function is going to go up or whether your function is going to go down, how far up or how far down it goes, it's based on the area bounded by the derivative in that specific interval. It's weird, it's kind of conceptual, but that's what this theorem says, right? It's how we do definite integrals and it's got some applications. The area bounded by the derivative over this specific interval, that's the same thing, f of b minus f of a, that's the same thing as your rise. That's the same thing as your change in your y values over that same interval, right? Little bit tricky, hopefully it makes sense. I'm gonna end this video here, just, just so it's not super long, uh, but then we'll, we will restart it uh, with the next example, right? So, so please watch the next video uh, too.